Hello, I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all around the world. And tonight, we'll discuss the relationship of morality to psychology and how we can find lasting emotional and spiritual peace and healing through the practice of self-restraining love. But before we do that, we want to talk briefly with EWTN's John Elson about a number of new programs premiering over the next month. John, what do you have for us? Good to see you, Father. Well, it's good to to, uh, share with our audience a number of really exciting program debuts in the near future. Mm -hmm. Uh, This Friday, July 1st, we'll be debuting a new documentary entitled In Search of America's Founders, dedicated to St. Hinipero Serra. On Saturday, uh, July 2nd, we're looking forward to debuting two new animated children's series. Uh, The first is entitled Adventure Catechism, which features a a brother Francis interacting with his friends on different adventures, during which they learn different truths about our Catholic faith Mm -hmm. and our Catholic Church. Following each episode of Adventure Catechism, we'll be also presenting a series entitled Lucas Storyteller, which tells the story of a young fish, uh, Lucas, who interacts with his other sea creature friends, who uh, talk about a specific virtue and then present the story of of a saint who modeled that virtue. Uh, next week, uh, July 6th, during this, uh, this upcoming episode of Eat of Tin Live, you'll have Michael O'Neill, producer and director of They Might Be Saints, as your guest. During the episode at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be debuting a new episode of They Might Be Saints dedicated to Rhoda Wise. Rhoda Wise was a, a very devout, holy woman who suffered tremendous physical ailments during her life. Uh, She reportedly had apparitions of our our Lord with St. Therese, uh, reported a uh, healing. A young uh, Rita Rizzo, our own mother Angelica, was brought to her attention and uh, Rita had interactions with mother. I invited mother to pray a a novena to St. Therese, which uh, led to mother's own healing from a stomach ailment early in her life. And that launched mother into a religious vocation, and the rest we'll save for the uh, for the episode that the people can enjoy. Uh, also, on uh, Friday, uh, July 8th, we'll be presenting another episode of They Might Be Saints dedicated to Father Augustus Tolton, the first African-American parish priest who was born of a Catholic family into slavery, uh, miraculously escaped uh, across the Mississippi River to Illinois, and was then educated in seminary in Rome and served uh, as, a, as a wonderful parish priest, enduring unfortunately a lot of the racism of of that time with great dignity. Uh, Also on Saturday, uh, July 9th, we'll be uh, debuting a new movie dedicated to Chiara Lubick. She's the foundress of the Focolori movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, She began her ministry as a grade school teacher in in, uh, World War II in in Italy. She then uh, banded together with a a number of like-minded young women uh, who served the poor. And that nucleus then grew into the Focolori movement, which is now in a, uh, more than 180 countries. And finally, I wanted to ask our viewers' prayers and also uh, give them a, a heads up, if you will, that we'll be uh, premiering in the months to come. Our new docudrama dedicated to the message of Lords. We'll be filming very soon uh, an original docudrama and movie entitled Faith of Our Fathers, dedicated to the suppression of the, I- of the, of the Catholic Church in Ireland during the English penal laws in the 1700s. And uh, we'll also be uh, filming in August a new docudrama dedicated to Pier Giorgio Frassati, currently blessed. And we're just excited to bring all of these uh, wonderful programs to our audience. You know, I'm uh, really fascinated with the one about Rhoda Wise mm-hmm. because as Mother Angelica used to say, I didn't like God and I didn't like nuns. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's cause for to start her cause right there right. to help Mother yeah. do both. That's right. All right, good. Well, thank you, John. We'll be back with our guest in just a couple moments, so please stay with us.
Welcome back. As we all should be well aware, there are rates of mental illness, drug addiction, and a variety of other psychological problems on the rise in our society. A lot of suicide, great depression. And many people have turned to clinical psychologists for help. But modern psychology is not without its problems for Christians seeking a healthy Christian emotional life. Our guest tonight has been a priest in the Dominican order for 50 years, and he's a familiar face to many of you who watch the network. His newest book addresses some of these psychological issues and gives a Catholic perspective, if not to say a Catholic answer, to the problematic theories of Sigmund Freud, the Neo-Freudians, and some of the other schools. So please welcome the author of the book, St. Thomas Aquinas Rescues Modern Psychology, old friend of the network and one of my friends, Father Brian Milady. Father Milady, how are you? Well, fine. The reason we're doing this, as you know, is by this weapon, because I have COVID. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. sorry yeah, I know. I'm that. sorry toward the end of it, but uh, still... Still. It's best not to mix with people too much. Yeah, no, that's wise. Uh, have yes. you lost your ability to taste? No, I still have that. I was remark remarking today that my illness hasn't done anything to stifle my appetite. Oh, good, good, yeah. good, good. Well, we don't want that to happen. All no. right, so a um, couple things. I, I really enjoyed your book, um, and... You bring out two things. One, you point out that clinical psychology has gotten some really fine insights into modern, psych well, probably not just modern, but human psychological needs. But on the other hand, the weakness is that it has focused on what's wrong with people, and it doesn't have a vision of what's right. Would that be a fair way to summarize the start of your book? Yes, and that's an insight I basically got from the person who actually founded a good bit of the book's principles, and that's Dr. Conrad Bars. Yes. I'm not really a psychiatrist, so I can't claim that. And so it would be wrong of me to, on my own authority, basically try to say this is what psychiatry thinks and things like that. Mm -hmm. However, I am a moralist. And as you know, emotional health, emotional illness, um, reaction to bad emotional teaching uh, often forms the basis for sin mm -hmm. and also for not taking seriously uh, Catholic moral teaching. And so as I was researching for my various teaching roles, uh, back in the 80s, I discovered, although I had known of his existence before, I never really studied him deeply, Dr. Conrad Bars, who himself was inspired by a Dutch psychiatrist named Dr. Anna Terua. They both claim that though the clinical work of Freud was brilliant, he suffered in his uh, abilities to cure people, and they found this was true with them because they were Freudian psychiatrists at one point along the line because they had a flawed picture of the soul. And the picture of the soul didn't allow for the spirit. And not only that, it tended also to a sort of Kantian view of the law, mm -hmm. whereas Kant thought the law was an imposition from the outside on our freedom basically. So in order for us to be truly free, and this would be including being emotionally free, we had to be free from the law uh, because he interpreted law only as basically human law. There was no natural law and things like that. So what they did was they believed, first of all, as you were pointing out, that abnormal psychology was a rotten start to try to determine normal psychology. 
It's like trying to determine health from sickness, where it should be the other way around. And secondly, that modern psychology tend to place a good bit of the difficulties that we have in the in what we would call reason. So, uh, in other words, you had to rid yourself of reason in order to allow your emotions free play. Now, to explain this, what they discovered was that the classical neurosis, which is um, repressive neurosis, did not have its origin in a conflict between reason and the passions, but well, among the passions themselves, because they had been malformed so that they weren't allowed to develop according to reason. And so instead of saying, well, you know, all of us have experienced in our moral theology since the 70s, where a person will confess masturbation and the priest will either tell him there's nothing wrong with it at all, um, or he'll tell him that uh, he's not responsible, period, so don't even worry about it. Now, a teenage boy may not be responsible for doing it up to a point, but it's not a good. So you can't tell somebody that there's something virtuous about it. In other words, in order to solve sexual difficulties, you free them from sexual restraint because all restraint causes emotional illness, which is wrong. The second thing is that the conflict actually occurs between what in St. Thomas, they studied St. Thomas, uh, what we would call the pleasure emotions, fancy name for which is the concupiscible appetite, and the usefulness utilitarian emotions, the fancy name for which is the irascible appetite. So, for example, a formation of neurosis, let's say regarding sexuality, is that a person, well-meaning educators, have taught a person that all feelings regarding sexuality are evil. While in puberty, you naturally have these feelings arise. It's not mature, and it's not really what will eventually be marriage, but it's like the immature basis for marriage and exploring them is what people do and or you used to do in courtships and that sort of thing where they had a restraint over what they did because of it but they had to admit that they existed and they had to come to some term with it well in a person that's kind of emotionally ill what's happened is they're so afraid of sin that they take interpret all sexual feelings as sin and so the fear comes up and it like stifles the natural emotion toward good and buries it alive. And in a severe case, it passes from the consciousness. In other words, it doesn't even admit it exists. Now the problem is in real virtuous practice, you have to allow the thing to exist and then come to direct it and humanize it. But this, when you bury it from your, even your, consciousness, there's no way in which it can be resolved in a human way. And so it constantly causes tension. And so you have a person who intensely fears sexual sin and yet compulsively commits it. And they have no freedom about it because they never form themselves in an immature way about it. So what therapy seeks to do depending on whether the repressing emotion, which would be the fear, or the repressed emotion, which would be the drive, is dominant, and the intelligence does enter in here, is you have to get the person who suffers from this to trust you enough to allow themselves to experience this uh, passion. And that is both an emotional trust and especially if you're involving a Catholic, you don't tell them, well, all Catholic moral teaching is wrong anyway. As we had a cardinal recently just say that all our teaching on homosexuality was wrong. We need to change it and say it was fine. You also have to have an intellectual trust that what the person is telling you is true. If that happens, then the character begins to unravel a bit. They're burying and allow the passion to exist naturally. And then what should have existed in puberty 
that then slowly becomes experienced in the actual experience of therapy. And then integration can finally occur in a virtuous way. Now, that's just one kind. Mm -hmm. The other kind is something they discovered. And that was that there were some people who said, doctor, I don't want you to solve my problems. I want you to just take me to yourself and love me. But the Western world is suffering. Solzhenitsyn said it was suffering from a spiritual problem. Mm -hmm. That could be emotionally expressed by the fact that people don't love their own existence. Mm -hmm. They don't think it's good that they exist. They believe the only reason it's good that they are exist is because they've accomplished something. And a good bit of our Western society, because of lack of family life, bad family life, is suffering from the fact that the reason people commit suicide when they're 12 is because they don't feel they should be here. And now we have this Roe versus Wade thing where all the women of some men, not all of them, but a, a, a strange number of them have come out basically saying they never want to have children because they basically dislike and hate children. And you have these companies who are now paying for your abortion because it's more um, economically sound to do that. Whereas in traditional terms, the reason a company existed was to provide a good and service and also to support a family. Instead, they don't want families. They just want ciphers, basically, of their own uh, work. So uh, the, way, the reason I wrote the book was to try to hold out to people that real Catholic moral teaching is not destructive of your emotional life. It's fulfilling of your emotional life. So in therapy, you're not freeing them from morality. You're freeing them from a strange interpretation of morality mm -hmm. for authentic morality, not from the law, but from a strange interpretation of the law for the law. See, this is a tension that is showing up on lots of levels. Um, you know, it, it, you mentioned earlier how Immanuel Kant saw the moral law as an imposition on freedom. And Freud explicitly refers to Kant uh, in that. The, for those who don't know, Kant was a very important German uh, philosopher in the 1700s. Well, yeah, and he set a lot of key issues. But then we see that this shows up even in the political realm, as some of the politicians don't want to impose the law on certain groups. Some groups they do so they can control them. Other groups they want not to, to punish for doing bad behavior, including murder and injury, things like that. And it, this mentality is showing up in wide areas of society, but it's not making people filled with peace, joy, and psychological integrity. Oh, yeah. Um, for example, this whole anti-family campaign. Yes. They don't want you to experience the joy that most people have had when they reach middle age and having children. I think one of the newscasters is more conservative said um, what uh, they want to substitute um, coffee parties at night for your family. I yes. mean, what? <laughs> what? You know, I, I, I've been recently in, impressed because I've been on Facebook with a lot of men from Indonesia, even though I don't speak their language. I find their culture fascinating. And this is not a rich country. But these people have five, six, seven children. They love their children deeply. Yes. We, we don't even want to have one. Uh, it, it's just incredible to me that people used to consider children a blessing, and now they consider them just a financial burden because it's all a matter of utilitarianism. Right. When, when, Paul, when you say utilitarianism, what do you mean by that? I mean that something's only good because it's useful. And that would include yourself. 
So um, Dr. Bowden uh, has a book, <laughs> which is, I think, I think rather amusing, where he compares Hitler to Marilyn Monroe. And he said both of them had terrible family lives. Mm -hmm. Both of them tried to prove that it was good that they existed, one by conquering the world and the other becoming the sex goddess of the world. And both of them ended in suicide yeah. because you can't affirm yourself. You have, it's a gift you receive from a loving other. The pri and primary person, of course, is God. But since we don't experience God directly, for most of us, our attitude toward God and Christ is very connected to our attitude toward our mother and father. Because remember, the parents take the place of God in educating the children. And that includes emotionally affirming them. So if I have the idea that the only reason my mother loves me is because I uh, got a degree or because I won a prize, she doesn't really love me. People say today, no child but a want a child. What do they mean by that? No child but one that fits into my life. In other words, it's all about me. And instead, we believe that you're not good because of what you do. You're good because you exist. Yep. Well, many yep. people don't believe it's good that they exist. They have to prove it. And this is showing up in very concrete ways with a large number of fairly young people, right. uh, children and teenagers, as well as older, who are committing suicide uh, Very because, sad. because they don't have a sense of their existence and why or they, they exist. Or they go in the drug culture, yep. you know, to deaden the pain of not thinking that their life is somehow meaningless or... And they don't turn to religion because that somehow brings mom and dad into it, too. And um, I was just reading an article today, I think, in the Wall Street Journal, that people expect the parents, the parents expect the school to substitute for them. School can't substitute for parents. Parents are the primary educators. They're the primary people that teach you your discipline and your, they would love. Um, and, and then, of course, in school, you carry that out. But if you, if you if they have no parents at home, it's very hard to discipline them in class. A lot of teachers are quitting because nobody supports them in the desire to discipline their children. Well, as a uh, matter of fact, when when we grew up uh, back in the fifties, if you misbehaved in school, the nuns never hit us, mm -mm, but our fathers true. sure wore us out. If right. he found out that you did what to the nuns? Right. Bend over. You know, they would be the disciplinarian. And, you know, today, the parents don't back up the discipline. They are trying to be their child's friends right. instead of being their parents. Again, my father had an eighth grade education. But he had common sense. Right. And he would say to me, I'm not your friend. I'm your father. Make your own friends. Right. You only get one father. And there was another kind of relationship. Now, as adults, we became sure. friends. You're sure, but, but you're formed emotionally, hopefully, by then. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you owe them respect, but not obedience, because... You can obey yourself now once you reach 18, you know. Right. But well, um, some people need a little bit more time in the oven than <laughs> just 18. Well, today, they ain't uh, done. I know a group of sisters that taught in a preschool that was so popular that people used to sign their children up for it in the womb. And they were from Italy and from India, and they were natural nurturers. But one of the sisters said, Father, every year it becomes harder because the parents don't know how to be parents. Yep. And that's that's part of our emotional difficulties. And they didn't have parents themselves. So they have no role models on which to, to, to judge. <laughs> and you can't just buy the kid a cell phone or take him to Disneyland or, or you know, something else. To, you know, you got to teach him, for example, that there's lumps in life and you occasionally fail and you got to deal with that. And but it doesn't mean you're not lovable, but it, it's something very weird.
well, going on. Here's, here's the other thing that, you know, both of us were born in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And the uh, rate of out of wedlock birth was 4%. Right. It had been 4% from the 1790 census all the way through the 1950 census. Mm -hmm. In 1960, it went up to 5%. Today, it's 52%. Right. And so they're growing up in single family houses right. where that means mostly their father didn't feel like having fatherhood imposed on him. That why should I have to pay for this kid? Let the state do it. Why sure. should I stay here? Why should I be responsible? And sometimes it's the mothers. The, the mother's gone, the father's there, or sometimes both. I know great-grandparents who are raising their great-grandchildren, right. you know, which is a grave difficulty. Um, right. you know, so these, you know, the, this not wanting to have rules like if you are the father of a child, you have responsibility to raise that boy or girl. Right. You know, and well, not just give them money, but be there to show them right from wrong. Have spiritual presence, right? Yep. yep. Well, unfortunately, it's modern psychology that has given into all this. Yep. And taught them it's fine. I, I quote that book in the book, uh, Guidelines to Human Sexuality, I think, mm -hmm. which was made in 1979 by the Catholic <laughs> Education Society, where they even justify bestiality. I mean, once contraception was approved. That was the dike that broke everything. And of course, the church didn't. The church has resisted it. But everybody said, oh, the church is wrong. The church is wrong. I think Paul VI was prescient because he Absolutely. predicted a lot of this. Stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Once you separate marriage and sex from children, which is what they've done, uh, why not become a transsexual? Right. You know, why not do all this stuff? I mean, and, and and what what's interesting is that Dr. Barz's colleague, Dr. Tarua, was on the minority commission in 1968 of the contraceptive discussion in the church, and she pleaded with Paul VI not to change the church's teaching because these two people believed that the contraception was not only morally evil, but it caused emotional illness because it reduced the child to an object of use instead of a subject of love. And John Paul II stuff is loaded with this stuff, you know. Yeah. He, he says well, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a, a great book original. called uh, Sexual Wisdom mm -hmm. by um, Dr. Wetzel. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he shows graphs that indicate the increased sale of contraceptives. And he, he shows the, the rapid increase of the sales of various kinds of contraceptives. But he superimposed on those graphs the increase of abortion, which follows the same uh, curve. The increase mm. of sexually transmitted diseases follows the same curve. Yeah. And the increase of out of wedlock birth follows that curve. And exactly. he said it was counterintuitive, but the reality is the more contraceptives people use, the higher the rates of sexual diseases, out of wedlock birth, and abortion. Because people think it's safe sex, and it's not. No. It's not. So they're, they're fooling themselves. Now, here's one of the things... I'd like to address from your book, which is these are the problems. And the genius of what you're presenting is Thomas's vision of what, St. Thomas Aquinas, that is, his vision of what the, um, uh, the, the vision of human, humanity, what does it mean to be human. And you start off with St. Thomas's great insight. It's reason and free will. These are starting points about human nature. 
Exactly. And, and also, uh, St. Thomas's great value is his anthropology in this context, which would mean that virtue, uh, true virtue is self-restraint, <laughs> is to be virtuous, especially for those of us who experience the weakness of a concupiscence of original sin, it does involve self-restraint, isn't destructive of us, it's maturing of us. And so the ideal would be in anything to have the intellect with prudence, coupled with the will with justice, affirmed by these two lower desires, appetites, a passion of appetites, with temperance in the uh, uh, driver's seat regarding um, pleasure, and with uh, courage or the irascible appetite in the driver's seat regarding um, uh, affirmation of truth and desire for good where they, uh, the uh, passions of the four cardinal virtues have often been compared to horses running a chariot race with prudence as their driver. Mm -hmm. The catechism does this, Arga Virtutum, it calls them. And this is where we can most easily make progress with self-restraining love. Instead of taking from the other, giving to the other, which is what personalism is basically about, mm -hmm. And also, John Paul II said in Theology of the Body that as a result of the original sin, we switched the judgment to "you're good because you exist" to "you're good be you you're good because you make me feel good." That's what the lustful look does in in our experience. That's the thing we need to correct. Yeah. And unfortunately, people have given into it big time. I mean. One of the reasons we're experiencing the sexual depravity in the clergy is because they've been taught for 40 years there's no sexual sins. Yeah. Everything goes if you feel loving. Well, so what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you yeah. really feel loving and it's proper love, it should be about marriage between two people that are around having a child. There's perfect, that's perfectly normal and natural, but all the rest isn't. And uh, they, yeah. Well, this this is a, a, a very important point because we're not just saying that you know uh, secular people, non-church people, but people within the church, including the clergy, get infected with these false notions of uh, the the role of feelings and become self-centered. And right. this is something that we all have to fight against, not give in to. Father, let's take a little break. We'll come back and continue this discussion and ask sure. all of our audience to please stay with us. No. Right, uh, as you heard us talk about at the top of the show with John Nelson, next week on EWTN Live, during our show, we will premiere a new episode of They Might Be Saints, Rhoda Wise. And we'll talk with the producer of that program, Michael O'Neill, and get some insight on Rhoda Wise's interaction with 19-year-old Rita Rizzo, Rizzo. This same Rita Rizzo would later be known as Mother Angelica. So this will be a good show for us to take a look at. Also, uh, Father Milady's book, St. Thomas Aquinas Rescues Modern Psychology, is available at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 82835. 82835. All right, follow the lady. Um, I think, you know, it's important for us in a world that 
often speaks of science and often speaks of psychology, but has a, a real problem with the psychology. I recall back when I was in university, uh, they had told us about a study on Freudian psychotherapy in which they took one group and gave them three years of Freudian therapy and another group they left alone. And the group they left alone did about two percentage points better in overcoming the psychological disorders. And they had roughly the same psychological disorders. So uh, that brought a crisis for psychology. A lot of people thought, and you see it in old movies about psychology, some of the uh, movies from the 1940s and 50s that dealt with psychological disorders. They believed that the psychologist, the psychiatrist, in fact, would replace the priest in counseling people and we wouldn't need religion. That was a goal of Freud. But they did not provide a vision of what human life should be. And they did not give a, a view of life and their techniques collapsed. And once the Freudian methods collapsed, we saw, you know, again, both of us can remember the magazine Psychology Today. And every week it was the therapy du jour, that right. one new kind of therapy, transactional analysis, primal right. scream, on and on and on with all these different things, because they didn't know what to do. Right. And if I had a, me a car mechanic with so many contradictory ideas of how to fix my car, I'd make sure I didn't go to that garage. Right. Yeah, you know, um, gosh, all of us are religious orders have been through so many of these yes. attempts to make us better psychologically that you wonder you know who who makes stuff with some of this stuff up yeah but um th there was the one where if you were had anger problems you just got mad and yes. you had a bat and you hit things and got mad and got mad and got mad but the trouble is your anger had no object i mean it wasn't about anything in particular and somehow just doing it was supposed to resolve your feelings about it um, I remember one time I was teaching night school in San Francisco. Oh, what an interesting experience. And these, this woman in the middle of class raised her hand and she said that she felt very sorry for me because I was going to have intense emotional issues when I got older because I believed feelings could be right and wrong. And she was just feelings and that was it. And I said, well, suppose you feel you're a purple cow. Oh, well, that's obviously ridiculous. And I said, well, why? I feel this can't be right and wrong. You know, I just, I, you wonder what brains go through, make these things up. And yet they're highly educated people, which is very strange, too. Well, um, not the value I, of Dr. Bart, I yeah. don't find that so odd, frankly. Okay. Um, sometimes the highly educated can talk themselves into anything very much the way the government officials talk themselves into believing that the emperor was wearing beautiful clothes that's when he right. was actually start naked. Right. Well, that's because we both dealt with educational establishments. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the value of Dr. Bars is that he did a lot of clinical work, and uh, he did a lot with religious and priests, and he loved religious and priests. But as you know, part of his original experience came from him being sent to a concentration camp during World War II yep. to Buchenwald. And he had been a student, a medical student in Holland, and he helped Allied flyers escape the Nazis. 
and they caught him and they put him in Buchenwald for three years as a young man and experienced with she survived. But he always uh, quoted this French priest who said, when one speaks of the privilege of having come out alive from Buchenwald, one should consider it a greater privilege to be sent there. And even this without surviving was a privilege. And you say, well, how can someone say something so stupid? But you have to read further. I mean, he said, yes, it was a privilege indeed, because in the concentration camp, I learned what was really worthwhile in life. Mm -hmm. And I had valued money. I valued, you know, pleasure and food. I valued my freedom. But I discovered the one thing I could not live without was God. And I hadn't valued God enough. Mm -hmm. And then he says, why does God permit wars and concentration camps? And he says, because he loves us. Because he wants to bring back to his fold those who otherwise in a life of pleasure and lusts would have been lost. And, and then he continues, much as Solzhenitsyn did at Harvard, where he said, unless the West learns that the cause of wars is this selfishness and this inability to put God in your life, things will keep getting worse, and, and, they, yeah. and they have. And it's also the same message that you hear in the book Man's Search for Meaning, mm. who was also, which was written by a man who had been in Auschwitz. I mean, to mm -hmm. think about how the communist gulag system produced Solzhenitsyn right. and the Nazi concentration camps uh, could produce Viktor Frankl of Man's Search for Meaning or Conrad Bars right. and many others. Many right. others who survived that. Many lost their faith. Mm -hmm. There were many others who became saints in those camps. Right. Well, that was a, a, it's a very interesting observation. And he also talked about the fact that um, the worst people in the concentration camp, but this isn't to get ethnic or prejudicial now, after the communists were the French, and he attributed that to the contraceptive movement, which began in the French Revolution, really. Mm -hmm. And he said the whole backbone of the French youth and its resistance for evil have been taken out of it. And mm -hmm. so when the communists basically killed them to get more food, they were basically following Malthusianism. Yep. The exhaustion of the world's food supply, the whole theory of the English cleric who started the whole idea to begin with. Yeah, Thomas Malthus. But a long, long time ago, you know, during the light. So uh, the reason I wrote this book was because I wanted to give a holistic picture of spirituality. And some of it I go through just the traditional um, interior castle of St. Teresa and her stages. But I did this because I wanted to show that there was a nexus between emotional health and, and integrity as a preparation for spiritual enlightenment, mm -hmm. grace. And so people need to realize that even if they're a loser, they're not bad people, that God yeah. still loves them. Yeah. And unfortunately, we have a lot of people who think that if they're a loser, their life is over. It's not over. It's, no. it's it's a different dimension. Actually, everybody's a loser in one way or another um, at some time or another. And so we, we have to learn to deal with failure as well as success. Exactly. And as you know, that's the one thing young people can't do. It's very hard for them. I, I learned more as a teacher because I finally resigned from teaching about a year ago that anything that's not an A, 100%, is considered by them a bad grade. And I, what, what? <laughs> and, and then on some I'd say, this is a little class and a little school. You can't base your life around this. You got a life that's par very much apart from this school, believe me, I do too. But they don't get it. It's, it's, uh, it's like talking to the wall. Um, so uh, anyway, we need to readjust our value systems. 
and mm. God needs to enter in again. I, I'm astonished at places like Italy, which so emphasized the family before, and mm. now they're lucky if they have one child. Yeah. Yeah. So, or if they get married at all. That's right. That's right. You know, we have a woman in our parish who's like almost 100, and she's Italian from a paese outside of Venice. And she said the saddest thing about visiting her town the last time she went was there was one child in the whole village. Yeah. Oh, yeah. gosh. And again, there's a number of things. In, when I've been to Italy, they talk about how a lot of men will continue living with their mother who continues doing all kinds of things for them. And they have girlfriends, but they don't want to have children and they don't want to start a family. And that separation of the sexual from the entire family structure, including the procreation of children as the primary purpose of sexuality, um, that kind of separation also becomes a basis for n men not becoming mature. Right. They don't make the commitment and they don't grow up. And this right. is well, not healthy for the men. It certainly right. impoverishes women and children. Yeah, because even they more. try to do both. They try to do both. Yeah. 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 And they Dr. Can't. Barnes believes that the lack of fatherhood is one of the principal psychological difficulties. In, I in the families could not in the agree West. more. Yeah. The, I remember when I lived in Italy, they'd say, I'm a father of a family, you know, with great pride. Now yeah. they don't care. You know, yeah. It's just. You know. But but that mentality is all over Europe. It's um, all over the United States. And. You know, it's in some countries like Russia, the population is decreasing by hundreds of thousands a year. Right. Because they don't want children, they don't want families, and right. their population is way lower than it was at the end of World War II. Right. And it wasn't from disease or death. It was no. just because people, men don't want to take the responsibility and that's what makes the men. That's why we're here. That's why we have the motions God gave us. Uh, Dr. Barr's, interestingly enough, quotes Homer in the Iliad, mm -hmm. uh, where he's, he's going out, uh, Hector's going out to fight uh, Achilles, mm -hmm. and Andromache, his wife, comes to him and says, Hector, you're everything to be. You're my mother, my sister, my father, and my brother. You're my husband in the prime of your life. And he says, what a woman has found in her home all the relationships she expects to find in her husband. And mm -hmm. uh, men don't have to say much, but they're the rock that on which everybody else puts their security. And now men are just playboys or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And that's true of priests, too. We receive the priestly charism to participate in this fatherhood, defending the truth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't. I, I was kind of amused because... Some of Dr. Barz's articles were published posthumously about 10 years ago, and one of them was called Mature and Affirming Bishops. <laughs> <laughs> and another was called The Priest for All Seasons of Masculine and Celibate, uh, yeah. because the priesthood is a spiritual participation in that whole spiritual fatherhood idea, and not just the one family but to his whole parish or to the whole world and yeah. part of it is you you're being caring about them and another part of it is you're telling the truth and i don't know how many rectories i've tried to call where the priest has a day off it seems like four days a week and he's never available even for anointing and uh, you want to say hey you're you know you're the spiritual father of this place you need to yeah. be around more at least well know? See, this is one of the issues of us being called father, that a father isn't on from nine to five. Right. He's a father 24-7. Right. And that kind of availability, you know, for our parishioners, if they 
if they're dying at two in the morning, you know, my sleep is irrelevant. They need their spiritual father. And the same thing too with us as priests, having a certain spiritual um, husband relationship with the church. If the church. Christ, yeah, if Christ is the bridegroom of the church, and we act in the person of Christ, mm -hmm. then we also, among other things, have to be willing to be a bridegroom to the church and love the church like a groom loves his bride. Right. Well, I know so many priests who've been accused, for example, mm -hmm. and they've been removing the priesthood without a trial, and some of them, I think, were innocent, but they never even had an interview with their bishop. They always dealt with someone in the chancery. Now, you'd think at least if he was going to remove you from ministry, he'd at least have the guts to have an interview with you. Yeah. yeah. But they don't, they don't even get to see their bishop in that regard. And, and see, that's where the Vatican Council was very clear in yeah. its document on the bishops that the right. bishop has to be a father to the priests. Right. So this issue of a, a, a fatherly relationship is extremely important. And yeah. I think we're, hopefully, we're done inside the church with attacks on patriarchy, um, but that we yeah. see instead there's a loving father. Not that I want to rule and tell everybody else what to do, but I'm there to give of myself. Right. Father, Father Milady, we're running flat out of time. We've got less than a thank minute. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being, thank you for writing this book. Uh, I think it's an important one. Uh, it's called St. Thomas Aquinas Rescues Modern Psychology. You can get it at EWTNRC.com where it's item number 828. And if you would join me in blessing our uh, audience, may Almighty God bless you all and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of His ways by His peace. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Always a, always a pleasure to have a Jesuit Dominican dialogue with you, Mitch. Absolutely. absolutely. It's real with us. Yes, yes uh, indeed, indeed. Yeah. And, you know, we can bring you Father Milady here and on radio and in his own series and all the other shows only because the network is brought to you by you. So keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.